Our text is Judges 16, 1 to 3. Then went Samson to Gaza, and saw there an harlot, and went in unto her. And it was told the Gazites, saying, Samson is come hither. And they compassed him in, and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city, and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. And Samson lay till midnight, and arose at midnight, and took the doors of the gate of the city, and the two posts, and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders, and carried them up to the top of an hill, that is, before Hebron. Beloved, after the great slaughter at Lehi, which we considered this morning, the Philistines seem to have left the Israelites alone for a while. The Philistines seem to have been subdued. After all, out of nowhere, it seems, a great judge has appeared who has been able single-handedly and without a proper weapon to kill 1,000 of them in one day. And thus they are most likely too afraid to attack Israel as long as Samson is around. And so we see here that Samson's judgeship, which according to chapter 15, verse 20, lasted 20 years, Samson's judgeship was mostly him keeping the peace. There were a few examples of his battles, but most of the time for that 20 years, he simply kept the Philistines at bay. And the Israelites, we would hope, learned this and learned to appreciate that God had given them a saviour. And so long as he ruled over them, they would be safe from their enemies. Samson does not appear after chapter 15 to have sought any further occasion against the Philistines. He seems to be satisfied to keep them at bay from the Israelites. And that, too, was an error on Samson's part. Samson ought to have been more proactive. Samson ought to have sought out more occasions to attack and to destroy the Philistines. The Philistines' presence in the land of Canaan was always a threat to the well-being of Israel and especially to the purity of Israel. Remember what God had said about the Canaanites. Destroy them. Destroy their gods. Destroy their idolatry. Why? Because if you don't, they will become a snare unto you. Which is exactly what happens time and time again in the book of Judges. And so we see here a weakness in Samson. He was too quick to stop the fight. And sadly, in chapter 16, we see another great weakness in Samson, a moral weakness in Samson. And really, in chapter 16, we see the decline of Samson's judgeship and as we shall see, Samson's judgeship ends when he dies in the temple of Dagon. You see, in chapter 16, Samson has begun, you might say, to enjoy his position as judge. He enjoys the fact that he can go where he pleases and do as he pleases. He enjoys the fact that he has this great strength that Jehovah has given to him, but he's not that interested, or really interested at all, in living a holy life. He thinks he can use the gifts that God has given to him to be an office bearer and judge in Israel for his own pleasure. 
And thus we find him at the beginning of chapter 16 in bed with a harlot. But God is not going to permit this behavior to go on for much longer. Because God, you see, loves Samson. And when God loves his people, he does not permit them to walk down the road of destruction and to be destroyed. Just as when you love your children, you do not allow them to walk out in front of a car and be killed. Because you understand that a loving parent will restrain their children for their own good. And so Samson himself will also have to be Restrained, And yet, in chapter 16, at the beginning, it appears that God is not yet going to chastise him. And that, you see, will be a snare to Samson. Because if God does not chastise early, the tendency is that we think to ourselves, I got away with that sin, and perhaps I will get away with that sin again and again and again. And a time comes when God comes in his chastisement and stops a child of God in his tracks. And so in chapter 16 in our text this evening, God indeed gives Samson a great victory. But it comes at a great spiritual cost. <coughs> Notice then, Samson removes Gaza's gates. Samson removes Gaza's gates. Notice first the miraculous event, then the significant victory, and finally the moral weakness. Samson, at the beginning of the chapter, is in the city of Gaza. Now Gaza was not an Israelite city. Gaza belonged to the Philistines. It was one of the great five cities of the Philistines. Remember the Philistines were ruled by five lords and they had five major cities. Ashdod, Ashkelon, Ekron, Gath and Gaza. And Gaza was a walled and heavily fortified city. Gaza had a prison house. Gaza had a great temple of Dagon. Gaza was an important city for the Philistines. And if you look in your Bibles at your Bible map, you'll notice that Gaza was some distance away from where Samson lived. Samson lived in Zorah. And Gaza was some 80 kilometers southwest of Zorah. Which means that Samson had to travel throughout the whole land of the Philistines to get to his destination of Gaza. We don't know why he went there. But he went there nonetheless. And that's significant. <laughs> That means that Samson, who, remember, is public enemy number one, is able to walk throughout the entire land of the Philistines, through the entire territory of the enemy, unmolested and unchallenged. He does not even need to go there in disguise. Although after the great victory at Levi, where he destroyed 1,000 Philistines, everyone will know who he is. It's clear, therefore, that the Philistine population are afraid of Samson, and they will not put their finger on him unless they have some special plan by which they might kill him. And as long as this Samson remains alive, they will not rise up again to attack Israel. Now Samson arrives at Gaza. He comes to the gate. And the gate presumably has a gate keeper. And the gate keeper allows Samson to enter into Gaza. 
We have a description of this gate in verse 3. There were doors. There were two posts. And there was a bar. Think of a large gate in a fortified city. Probably you had two large poles made of either stone or wood. And you had a large wooden gate. And you had a large metal bar or perhaps a wooden bar which closed this gate. You may also have had watch towers and rooms because you'll notice that those who were lying in wait for him were lying in wait for him in the gate. And therefore this was a large, impressive structure. And so Samson arrives at the gate. He goes in through the gate. The gatekeeper allows him to enter into the gate. And he goes into the house of an harlot. And he spends the night there. No one stops him. No one questions him. And he decides after he has finished his business in Gaza, he is going to leave. He decides to leave at midnight when it is dark. That too is unusual. People do not usually in that day travel at night. <coughs> it's dangerous to travel at night. There are bandits. There are wild animals. There was no street lighting in that day. But those kind of things were no obstacle to Samson. He didn't worry about those things. After all, he could kill a lion with his own bare hands. And as he wakes up at midnight, decides to leave, he does not find that these gates are a barrier to his leaving. He is the servant of Jehovah. He does not ask the gatekeeper if he would mind opening the gates. He simply lifts the gates and carries them with him. <coughs> Think of that. At midnight, there's this cracking, crashing sound heard in the city of Gaza. It's the sound of cracking stone, splintering wood and breaking Metal. It is the sound of Samson removing Gaza's gates. There's no sensational description in the text. It simply says in verse 3, And Samson lay till midnight, and arose at midnight, and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts, and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders, and carried them up to the top of an hill that is before Hebron. He took hold of the gates, he seized the gates, and he went away with the gates. Just as you would pull a flower out of your garden, <coughs> and leave a little hole behind where the flower had been planted. So Samson, with barely any effort, simply uproots the gates with the whole structure and places it upon his shoulders. He does not destroy or demolish the gate. He simply lifts it up and removes it intact in one piece the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them, bar and all. Now this structure must have weighed several tons. And he did this without any kind of a weapon, with no battering ram, with no siege engines, with no tool, simply by brute force. And again, beloved, we must not think of Samson as some kind of a Hercules figure who was incredibly muscular, 
who was a bodybuilder, Samson could not have done this in his own strength. No man, no matter how much working out he does at the gym, could do this in his own strength. Samson did this by the power of God. We're not told that explicitly in the text, as on other occasions, that the Spirit of God came mightily upon him, but that's exactly what must have happened, because God is the source of Samson's strength. God gave Samson the power to do this. Why? Because he loved Samson, and because he loved Israel, the people of Samson, and because he loved his own name and desired to glorify his own name. And Israel must know, and the Philistines must know, and they will hear of this, that there is a God in Israel, a God who so loves his people that he empowers his servant to lift the gates of Gaza and transport them somewhere else by supernatural strength, by the strength given by God himself. And having lifted up these heavy gates upon his shoulders, Samson begins to walk away. And this too is a feat of supernatural strength. Difficult enough to uproot these gates in the first place. One thing it would be to take those gates and chuck them over in the corner and then go home. But Samson doesn't do this. He places them upon his shoulders and he walks all the way to a hill which is before Hebron. And that's some distance. He carried, therefore, the gates of Gaza from the city of Gaza throughout the land of the Philistines all the way into the land of Israel, to the territory of Judah, up a hill (coughs) near Hebron, which is 60 kilometers. That again shows us that this is a miracle. Try to picture that in your mind. Here's a man, he's lying in bed, he wakes up at midnight, he uproots the gates of the city, he carries them from Gaza all the way to Hebron, and as he does so, he has to march through many Philistine villages and towns. This would have taken him hours and hours to walk. And many Philistines would have seen this man walking with the gates of Gaza and they would have seen, those are the gates of Gaza. What in the world is happening? Fear would have filled the Philistines' hearts. Who is this man? Who is this man who can slaughter 1,000 of our men with the jawbone of an ass? And who is this man now who can take the gates of one of our most prominent cities uproot them and now carry them throughout the land as a trophy. And what kind of a God is this that can give man power to do this? And this must also have been wonderful for the Israelites to see as they see Samson, who is well known to them, coming trudging along with this massive structure upon his shoulders. And they say, what in the world is that? Gates, the gates of Gaza. He deposits them on top of a hill for men to see from all around. And people can come and look at these gates of Gaza and see what their hero, Samson, has accomplished by the power of God. You can think of parents bringing their children to see the gates of Gaza. Look, boys and girls, the gates of Gaza. Samson has brought them all the way from Gaza and now they're sitting up on a hill for us to look at. What a great God we serve. That ought to have been the reaction of God's people to this 
miracle. And this miracle, beloved, was extremely humiliating for the Philistines and a great victory for God's people. Consider what the gates of Gaza mean. The gates of Gaza are her glory and her protection. Gaza, as I said, is one of the five prominent cities of the kingdom of the Philistines. It may even have been her capital city. This was no mean village, therefore, that Samson came to. And about Gaza, the Philistines could well have said, in a paraphrase of Psalm 48, Walk about Gaza and go round about her. Tell the towers thereof, mark ye well her bulwarks, consider her palaces. Gaza undoubtedly boasted about her defences, as every walled city does. We have great gates at Gaza. No one could ever conquer us at Gaza. And her boast was vain because Jehovah's servant could simply come into Gaza and simply uproot her gates and carry them all the way into Israel and no one could lift a finger to stop him. What a laughing stock Gaza must have been when word had spread throughout Philistia and the surrounding nations and had spread into Israel, what a laughing stock Gaza must have been. Where the gates were now is a gaping hole. Gaza is defenseless. And think too of what gates were in the Old Testament. Gates were the place of business. And concourse. We're told several times in the Old Testament that the elders of the city would meet in the gates to make decisions. That's the center of politics, is the gates. That's where discipline would take place. That's where punishments would be decided, in the gates. And businessmen met in the gates to do their business deals. And Samson simply removes the gates of Gaza. They're gone. Gone in one night. Gone without any war. Simply removed. It's a blow to their security. It's a blow to their commerce. It's a blow to their politics. An enemy entering their city and single-handedly destroying their parliament, destroying their business sector, destroying their security services in one day. And this is after, remember, Samson had devastated their economy by destroying their fields and all of their crops. No wonder they are afraid of him. No wonder they are so desperate by the end of chapter 16 to find some way of destroying him. No wonder they will go out of their way and spend huge amounts of cash on finding some way of getting his secret out of him. He has brought one of their most prominent cities to its knees. And all the more humiliating this is because this is exactly the opposite of what they expected should happen. When they heard that Samson had entered Gaza, they thought to themselves, Aha! We have him now. He's come to Gaza. We've closed the gates behind him. He is trapped and we will kill him. Notice he comes into Gaza. Verse 2 says, It was told the Gazites. They had spies. Perhaps the harlot told them. They surrounded him, verse 2 says, they compassed him in, they hemmed him in, and they laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city. Notice where they waited for him, in the gate of the city. 
and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning when it is day, we shall kill him. They think they've got him. They're waiting in the gates of the city. They're being very quiet so as not to alert him to their presence. They're hoping in the morning that they can kill him. They have all things worked out, they think. And before they know it, at midnight, their prey wakes up and suddenly removes the gates where they are hiding. And they are so shocked that there's nothing they can do. And so they are utterly humiliated. What a rude awakening, beloved, this must have been to them. And no doubt, Samson thought it very amusing. It was great fun for him to do this, to humiliate the enemies of God in this manner. But, as we'll see, he's playing with fire because he is, even at this time, involved with an harlot. But Samson, beloved, is a type of Jesus Christ. Not, of course, in everything he does, because then typology would go too far. But he is a type of Jesus Christ, as Samson is a judge, so Jesus Christ is the Savior. He is a dim reflection. He is a shadow of the great Savior and Deliverer. His work is a shadow or a picture of what Christ himself will do. Turn to Genesis chapter 22. Here's God's promise to Abraham after Abraham shows himself willing to sacrifice Isaac. Genesis 22 verse 16. And God said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. This is a partial fulfillment of that prophecy. Thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Samson possessed and spoiled the gate of his enemies. But Jesus Christ, he spoiled the gate of the kingdom of darkness. Samson was unafraid to enter this citadel, to enter through the gates of Gaza. And Jesus Christ was unafraid to enter into Satan's lair and there to do battle against him. And Christ says about his own church and about his building of his own church, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And as Jesus Christ then storms the citadel of Satan, he spoils hell's defences, he frees hell's captives, he makes an open show of hell's forces, and he left the devil a laughing stock before heaven. Here's what Colossians 2.15 says, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he that is Christ made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it, that is, in the cross. And then in Luke, Jesus says, When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are at peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him the armor wherein he trusted and divideth his goods. And so Jesus 
divided the goods of Satan, spoiling him and taking away that which he had taken to himself. And just as there is no obstacle which can stand before Samson in the history which we have considered this evening, so there is no obstacle which can stand before Jesus Christ as he is determined to save his church. By the power of Jehovah, Samson destroyed the gates of Gaza. By the power of Jehovah, and Jesus Christ is Jehovah, Jesus Christ overcame the powers of darkness. And thus, beloved, we need not fear the gates of Gaza today. We think sometimes as we see the gates of darkness, oh, those gates are impregnable. We could never get through them. But they have already been destroyed, beloved. There is right now a gaping hole in the gates of the kingdom of darkness. Christ has smashed into the kingdom of darkness and has despoiled it. And we who were citizens of that kingdom of darkness, and the gates of that kingdom of darkness kept us in, we have been released from the kingdom of darkness by the work of Jesus Christ. And the second thing that this story reminds us of concerning Christ is the awful burden of the cross. We are rightly impressed by Samson's ability to carry the burden of the gates of Gaza. Imagine trying to place that gate upon your shoulders. You could not even get up there. And imagine trying to carry that gate even one step. Samson carried that gate all the way from Gaza to beyond Hebron. And that's because he was empowered by the Spirit of God. And so we're not going to be cowed by the unbelieving critics who say, oh, this is impossible. This is just a legend. This is just a fairy tale. No, we believe that this happened just as it is described because we believe in the power of God. Nothing shall be impossible with God. But Jesus, he bore a heavier burden than that. A gate which weighs some several tons, which has to be carried some 60 kilometers, that's a heavy burden. But Jesus carried the cross. He carried the cross up the hill of Calvary, which was beyond Jerusalem. And it wasn't so much the wood of the cross that was the crushing burden upon Jesus Christ, the physical wood upon his back, but the burden which Christ had to bear was the burden of sin. The crushing, well nigh overwhelming burden of sin and guilt. And Jesus Christ, as he walked up Calvary and as he hung upon the cross, was bearing in his own body the awful weight and the guilt of Sam Samson's sins. And the sins of all of God's elect people from every nation from the beginning of time all the way to the end of time. And the awful weight of God's wrath pressed down upon him. Compared to that, Gaza's gates are nothing. Much easier to carry Gaza's gates than to carry the burden of the sin of all of God's elect people and the wrath of God against that sin. And Christ did not simply carry that for a time and then deposit it somewhere on a hill, but rather by his death upon the cross, Christ completely and finally and eternally removed the guilt of our sin. It's gone, it's forever gone, and God will never bring it against us again. And so here we see a wonderful picture 
of the cross of Jesus Christ. Now this beloved, this story, this history is a great victory for God's people in the Old Testament. But there is with this great victory, in the midst of this great victory, there is shameful defeat. It stares us in the face. We don't even like to think about it. But it tells us in verse 1, Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went in unto her. Hard to believe. Shocking. Should be shocking. If we had read this for the first time, we should be shocked. Here's the judge of Israel who has done a great work by the power of God in destroying the gates of Gaza. And what was he doing in Gaza in the first place? He was with a harlot, a prostitute. He was sleeping with a prostitute. And here we see the sin of Samson is getting worse and worse. Before this, he married a Philistine woman. And we saw that that was a sin. Because God's people are not to marry unbelievers. And God's people are not even to date unbelievers. Because dating is always with a view to marriage. And that was a sin. And that ended terribly for Samson. But at least he married her. Although it was a shameful marriage. But here, Samson is sleeping with a woman he meets casually on the street of Gaza, and she is a an harlot. And a harlot, or a prostitute, is simply a woman who sleeps with men for money. She sells her body for money. Now, it's unlikely that Samson went all the way, 80 kilometers or so, all the way from his hometown to Gaza simply to sleep with this prostitute. It's more likely he just met her on the street, simply as we read, for example, in Proverbs 7. He, as it were, strayed into her area and was enticed by her. But for all that, this is a gross violation of the seventh commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And there is no excuse for this behavior. He went into her means that he went in and slept with her. Again, I say this is shocking. He saw a woman who was a prostitute, he saw her on a street corner in the city of Gaza. And when he saw her, he did not turn his eyes away from her. He did not turn his ears away from her flattering words. He walked right into temptation and he finds himself in her bedroom. Now Samson knew he knew the stories of Israel's history. He knew that a good Jew must not do this. He knew the Ten Commandments. He knew what Joseph had done many years before this in Egypt when Potiphar's wife had tried to seduce him. He knew that the solution to this problem is not to go into the harlot but to flee from her. But he follows her into her bedroom. And you can hear the excuses, as men who commit sin always try to excuse themselves. Oh, it doesn't mean anything. It's only a one-night stand. It's only going to happen this once. And no one knows about it, because after all, I'm very, very far away from home 
In Gaza, there are no Israelites around here to see. And I can stop when I want to. That's a common one. I can handle it. It won't affect me. I can stop when I think I've got in too deep. And besides that, God will forgive me anyway because God's a God of forgiveness. Oh, how wrong Samson was. First of all, God knew. Oh, God knew. God saw. And God even has it recorded in the scriptures so that we know. So that down through history, God's people who read the scriptures know that Samson shamefully slept with an harlot. So that God's people Israel can be warned, as Proverbs 7 said, that the harlot has slain many a strong man. And who was stronger? Who was stronger than Samson in the Bible? And no, you can't handle it. You can't just play with sin for a little while and then hope you can pull yourself out before you get in too deep. Because sin is very deceptive. And sin is like a serpent which slowly but surely it starts to encircle its victim coil by coil until before the victim knows the serpent starts to squeeze and then it's too late. You can't escape from the serpent's coils. Turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Death. And Samson's sin is all the worse. It is aggravated by several other factors. Samson is not merely an ordinary Israelite. Samson is a judge. Samson, therefore, is an office bearer in Israel. Samson is a representative of Jehovah to the nation. Now, it's one thing, beloved, when an ordinary church member commits a gross public sin which makes him worthy of church discipline. That's a shame. It's even worse when an office bearer does it. When a pastor falls into such a sin, or an elder or a deacon, then there is even more shame brought upon God's name. And how ought Israel to blush when they read this? A judge. God sends a judge. God sends a saviour or deliverer for his people Israel. And where do we find him? In bed with a prostitute. And oh yes, the carrying away of the gates of Gaza certainly glorify God. But this does not glorify God. This brings shame upon the name of God. This is a reason why God's name is blasphemed among the heathen. And besides that, Samson was a Nazarite. A Nazarite. A Nazarite, remember, is a man who is dedicated in a holy vow to Jehovah. And therefore, a Nazarite ought to be even more holy than the common Israelite. And here we have a Nazarite in bed with a prostitute. It's not the carrying away of the gates of Gaza, beloved, that's difficult to understand. 
It's Samson's behavior that's difficult to understand. Samson, as far as we know, was not drinking wine. And Samson's hair was still as long as it ever was. It was not cut. And so outwardly, Samson was keeping his vow to be a Nazarite. But Samson's life is unholy. Scandalously unholy. He's in bed with a whore. And so God has a word for Israel in this history. As it were, God is holding up a mirror in the face of Israel and saying, Do you see? Do you see? I have given you a Nazarite, someone who is holy unto me. And do you see what kind of Nazarite he is? He's an unholy Nazarite. He's a Nazarite who breaks the seventh commandment. He's a picture, Israel. He's a picture of you. You are a holy people unto me, and you are like those who sleep with prostitutes. Because when you go after Baal or Ashtaroth or some other god, you are going a whoring after them away from me. And so repent, repent, and turn from your idols. But do you notice, beloved, and this is very, very serious. Did you notice? Samson gets away with it. Samson sleeps with a prostitute. And Samson still prospers. Samson is not yet arrested by the Philistines and cast into prison. There are no immediate consequences And Samson does not yet repent. In fact, God enables Samson, even after he sleeps with this prostitute, God enables Samson to carry away Gaza's gates. And that, beloved, is a danger. A great danger for Samson. Because Samson believes that God is blessing him in his sin. And that's always a danger for us as well. When we're walking in sin and nothing untoward, nothing negative begins to happen to us, we're thinking to ourselves, God is turning a blind eye to my sin. And there are no consequences to my sin. And therefore God doesn't really care about my sin. And I can keep sinning. In a word, Samson is becoming presumptuous. Presumptuous. He's presuming on God's mercy. He's taking it for granted. And he thinks, because God is merciful, I can use this as an excuse to sin. You see, beloved, Samson enjoys being judge. He's having fun in our text. He's having fun humiliating the Philistines. He's having fun showing off his great strength. And he's having fun even sleeping with the prostitute because he can. Because he can. And he makes no effort whatsoever to curb his lusts. He looks to God for physical strength. He expects God to give him physical strength. That's why he was so confident that he could simply lift up the gates of Gaza and go off with them because that's the kind of thing that God would enable him to do. He is Samson. But he's not praying, lead me not into temptation. He's not praying that. And that's going to be his downfall. And all of this is going to change dramatically when he meets Delilah. Because Delilah is going to be able to wheedle out of him his secret. And then he will not be able to resist her 
and then there will be serious consequences for Samson. The child of God, beloved, must never think that because he got away with sin once, that God will allow him to get away with sin forever. And the longer the child of God continues on that path of sin, the heavier the chastisement will be when finally he comes to repentance. Samson sinned in marrying the Philistine. He ought to have learned his lesson. His wife and his father-in-law were murdered. But he didn't learn his lesson. He goes into worse sin. And the more Samson sins, the heavier will be God's chastisement on him when he finally falls. And beloved, make no mistake, we know what happens in this story. God will chastise Samson. He will. Because, as God says elsewhere, he chastises every son that he loves. And God loves Samson. And sometimes fatherly love must come with a certain amount of severity. And that's really, beloved, the tragedy of Samson. Samson could carry away the gates of Gaza. He had the strength to do that, but Samson could not control himself. Here's Proverbs 16.32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. And Proverbs 25.28. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down, and without walls. And so we ought not to be surprised when Samson finally falls, and he falls doing the things that he was doing in our text. Delilah, we're not sure who exactly she was. <coughs> we know she was a wicked woman. We know that Samson ought not to have become involved with her. And he'll fall. He'll fall in her lap. And he will be chastised, as will be clear. And so, beloved, we don't look to Samson. Samson is a type of Jesus Christ. He's a type of Christ in many ways, but he had his flaws. And every type of Christ in the Bible has flaws. We don't look to him. We look to Christ, who has no flaws. Samson is a warning to us. And when we're tempted, we flee from temptation. Not into the arms of Delilah, but into the arms of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father in heaven, thy word is a warning to us. Enable us to walk in humility and in fear. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. For Christ's sake. Amen.